Hello and welcome back to our uh, Reading Through Mark series. We're dipping our feet into the Gospel of Mark to get to know Jesus just a little bit better and talking about the various thoughts that come up along the way. Today we are in chapter 10. We're beginning there. So uh, this section is called Divorce, interesting enough. Uh, Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people uh, came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? He replied. He said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. Then, or when they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. This is God's word. <clears throat> now, this is a really interesting section here uh, for a number of reasons. First off, uh, so the Pharisees want to test Jesus. They want to um, ask him about this very difficult issue. Divorce was a difficult issue back then, and it's still a difficult issue uh, in our culture today. Um, and so they want to ask Jesus about uh, whether or not divorce is permissible, if it, if it is a good thing, if it's an allowable thing. Um, and we get a fascinating uh, reality from the scriptures here. Um, the Pharisees look to the law of Moses, those laws that God set up for the people of Israel, uh, specifically in that culture where God does allow divorce uh, in, in, that, in that context. Uh, but Jesus then points out that it was actually because their hearts were hard um, that, that God allowed divorce legally. However, uh, this legal allowance, this legal permission was not indicative of God's actual desire for how marriage ought to be. God wants marriage to be a lifelong union. Jesus makes this uh, very clear that uh, one man and one woman are to become one flesh, united for the rest of their lives. And this is how God wants marriage to be. <clears throat> um, and so it is very interesting because it gives us um, something to chew on, maybe something that a lot of Christians are not comfortable with. Um, very often, uh, we, want, we want our politics to reflect uh, what, what is the ideal, what is the perfect thing. And there is a point to that, but there is also a reality that uh, our politics has to take into consideration that we are evil people. <laughs> uh, and also that uh, we're not all Christians. We're not all led by the Spirit of God in these things. And so there are places where God himself allow, uh, ha allows legal permissions for things that are evil, for things that are not according to his will just because uh, we are dealing with people that uh, are hardened against God. Um, so again, there, there is a place for us as, as Christians, as we uh, navigate the political realms, as we talk through political ideologies, uh, that we cannot expect unbelievers to share the same values that we have as Christians. Uh, and so if you're having a political discussion with somebody, you can't say, well, the Bible says this. They, they don't care about what the Bible says, right? And so we as Christians need to be able to uh, defend our arguments on the same ground uh, as other people. And so uh, can we make a rational, can we make a uh, sociological or, or whatever other kind of argument for what we are, what we believe as Christians? Um, and can we also allow for those places where we're going to disagree with other people? Uh, God even has this set up even in those Old Testament laws that he gave the people of Israel. Uh, Jesus goes back to the creation accounts to get the, the more uh, full desire of God regarding marriage, that it is a man to leave that unit he has with his family that he grows up with and instead to unite with his wife and become a new unit by which they are one flesh. Um, now, the Bible does give two biblical reasons for divorce, and it really comes down to um, God allowing divorce in cases where the marriage has already been broken. So in Matthew chapter 19, uh, pornia is described. That's sometimes translated as marital unfaithfulness. Uh, so where uh, one spouse has cheated on another. Um, God allows divorce in that case. <clears throat> God says that divorce is not adultery because adultery has already happened in that case. Uh, the marriage has already been broken, and so that legal divorce is simply acknowledging the reality that has already come across there. That's not to say that um, uh, a marriage can't survive uh, infidelity. That, that, that also certainly happens uh, in some cases, and that can be a, a wonderful way to glorify God. But, yeah, that, that allowance is there. 
We also see an allowance in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15, where it says, If the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. So there's that other aspect too, uh, this malicious desertion. Um, and so there are, uh, again, there are difficult situations when it comes to divorce. There are places where the, the marriage uh, vow has been broken, uh, either because uh, the unbeliever decides to leave and abandon their spouse, or, or maybe there are other uh, violent or uh, abusive things going on or something like that that uh, breaks that marriage uh, relationship already. Um, and so there, again, there are these difficult situations, um, but we want to we want to, as Christians, we want to be aiming at the ideal. We don't want to be looking to, how can I possibly get out of this marriage? And that, that's not a, a godly way to be thinking about these things. We instead want to be thinking, how can I achieve the ideal? Uh, and if I am in a situation where, yeah, that marriage has already been broken and it's it's not uh, something that is, that is able to be fixed, not something that uh, can be pursued in a godly way, um, then yeah, that division is, is a better way to do it so that, yeah, we can live a life of peace. We'll continue on next uh, where Jesus moves on to talk about little children. In uh, chapter uh, 10 again, verse 13, people were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. Here again, we get a fascinating, um, fascinating picture of what the kingdom of God is all about. Many people today uh, will say, well, you know, little kids can't uh, choose Jesus. They can't make a decision for Jesus. They can't commit their lives to Jesus. And so uh, they aren't actual Christians. And Jesus has a completely opposite idea. <laughs> Jesus says, no, let the little children come to me. And in fact, unless you become like a little child, uh, you cannot be, uh, enter the kingdom of God. Um, in Luke chapter 18, we get a parallel account here. And it says that the children here have not been weaned yet. Uh, so we're talking very little babies, right? Uh, infants that are still breastfeeding. Um now, again, why would the disciples rebuke people for bringing little children? Back in that culture, as with sometimes today, we write off little kids uh, because what use are they, right? They're no value. They only suck up our resources from the rest of society. Um, but Christianity again and again, it makes it clear that the weakest, the smallest, the people that are of no relevance to the world are still valuable in God's sight. And therefore, God still wants the little children. Uh, he wants the weak. He wants the people that society don't, doesn't care about. Uh, Jesus does care about them. Jesus died for them. And so we are not to bar anybody from God. Um, finally, uh, one, one interesting thing is to think about what does it mean to receive the kingdom like a little child? Um, Many people will say, well, children just don't ask questions. They just uh, believe whatever you tell them. That's not at all what God says uh, in the scriptures. Instead, God encourages people to look into these things, to study the scriptures for themselves, to ensure that what they are believing uh, is true. The Bible continually warns against false teachers. How do you, uh, how do you uh, um, stand against a false teacher? You can't stand against a false teacher if you're just believing everything that you're told without asking any questions, right? Uh, you have to examine what is being taught to you. Um, and so then the question is, what does it mean to receive the kingdom like a little child? Well, it's this. Children don't receive any good thing because of their hard work, because they've earned it. Instead, when, they, when a little child, when a breastfeeding child receives something good, it is only because of the goodness of the person giving the gifts to them, right? It is only because their mother or father or somebody else is being generous to them. And so in the same way, this is how we are to receive God's gifts to us, uh, that we recognize that we haven't earned anything good from God. It is only because he is good, he is merciful, he is uh, serving and blessing us. Yeah, we'll squeeze one more in here. Okay, so verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. 
The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And Peter said to him, We have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecutions, and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first, or in the last first. This too is God's word. <clears throat> now again, fascinating stuff here. Um, Jesus is saying, uh, here, as this guy comes and asks Jesus, yeah, how do I get into eternal life? Um, and Jesus says, obey the commandments and you'll have life. And now this is what the law of God says, that if you are good enough, you can gain eternal life. The question is, how good do you have to be? You have to be perfect. And so Jesus points this man to the commandments to show him that he's really off. And if you noticed, uh, one of his commandments here uh, is, most of them are the Ten Commandments, but he also adds in, do not defraud. Uh, some commentators will suggest that this man may have actually had an issue with uh, defrauding others, and that might have been why he is a, a rich young ruler. Um, but the man doesn't quite get it. He doesn't quite recognize uh, his failure to obey God's laws. Uh, and so Jesus instead uh, points him to a, a very clear command that he cannot. Uh, he calls him to sell everything he has and then follow Jesus. Uh, and so the man can't do it. Uh, and it shows that he is not actually loving God with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind. And that's another interesting thing. When you look at the commandments that Jesus places in front of him, he points him to love for his neighbor rather than love for God. Uh, but when he calls him to sell everything he has, well, that makes it very clear that this man does not love God, excuse me, love God above all things. If he did love God above all things, then he would be willing to obey this command. Now, here's a, a good question for us to ask. Um, do uh, you and I have to sell everything in order to follow Christ? Uh, we certainly have to be willing to sell everything. But God has not given a universal command to Christians uh, everywhere to sell everything they have. Uh, he has called us to, to make sure that God is number one in our hearts. And so uh, if, if it does require me to get rid of my earthly possessions in order to serve Jesus, I ought to be willing to do that as a Christian. Um, but he does not uh, command every single Christian to do these things. We see many accounts of Christians, even in the Bible, who are wealthy uh, and they use that wealth to God's glory. And so, too, rich people today can uh, believe in Jesus Christ. Um, next, uh, Jesus makes it very clear that the rich... Uh, have an extra uh, difficulty getting into heaven. And the disciples get so surprised by this that they actually think, well, when, who, who possibly can get to heaven, right? Uh, Jesus makes it clear that it is impossible for every one of us. None of us, whether you're rich or poor, can get, get to heaven on our own because none of us can be good enough, right? This guy comes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, why do you call me good, right? No one's good except God. You and I throw that word good out <laughs> to describe people way too often. Uh, we ought to have more humility. None of us is good in God's sight. Uh, only Jesus. And so we need his salvation uh, to be saved. And this is where, again, Jesus makes it clear. Uh, it is impossible for any of us to be saved. It'd be easier for the cam a camel to go through that eye of a needle uh, than for any of us to be saved. But with God, this is uh, possible. Just as we saw that little child, uh, it's impossible for that child to gain good things for himself because that child can't do anything, but he trusts somebody that is giving him good things, right? Somebody else who is good and generous toward him. Uh, so in the same way, you and I, we can't earn our salvation, but like a little child, we can trust God who is good to give us salvation through Jesus Christ. All right, that's all for now. God's richest blessings on you until we meet again. And I say, I say, I say, it can't be that easy. And he said, he said, and no, it wasn't easy.